So I finally got around to upgrading the lighting on my workbench. Uh, I just wound up using LED strips, uh, the ones that you can buy fairly cheaply. And actually, I bought these for uh, a TV I repaired recently. Um, I didn't film it. It's actually my own TV. The backlight went out, and I replaced the backlight with a bunch of these and built my own circuit to drive them so that they would uh, you know, come on with the TV, etc., and it works pretty well. It's not exactly as bright as it was before, but the room that it's in is pretty dark, so it, it doesn't matter. But anyway, I used some of what was left over um, for the workbench here. And if the camera doesn't look right, I have it on auto, fully auto everything. So Because uh, I don't have any of the profiles set up for the new lights. But what I need to do is build an LED dimmer. And we're going to use a 555 chip to do that. And it's going to be a pulse width modulated dimmer. Now this here is, it's no secret, this is, you can find this anywhere on the internet. Uh, this is the basic design, basic circuit for using a 555 for a PWM dimmer. So here's the circuit that we're working on in a simulator. And you'll see that we have the oscilloscope plugged straight to the output of the 555IC. And to explain what uh, PWM is, if you notice, what we're looking for is the pulse width. And what you can see is how long it's actually turned on. This is 0 volts, this is, and this is 10 volts. Now if we change the potentiometer, turn it down some, we notice the pulse width the pulse width is actually much shorter. So therefore, the LED is going to be turning on for a shorter amount of time and then turning back off. Now, this is happening very quickly, much faster than our eyes can see. And this is the persistence of vision effect. So the higher the potentiometer is turned, and that's about, a I don't know, around a 90% duty cycle, meaning the LED is turned on 90% of the time. And that's how PWM works, because the LED is always operating at the same current. It's operating at the same voltage. It's just not operating all the time. I guess you could say. It's like a strobe effect, but it's happening very, very, very quick, so you can't see it. So instead of with a regular dimmer, you would go to 5 volts, and if you want it to be dimmer, the voltage would decrease until it was at zero. The problem with doing that is, as you notice, if you have any kitchen lights or any dimmers in your house, when you turn the dimmer down, the color temperature changes. It usually gets a lot warmer um, or more orange color to it. Well, the same thing happens with LEDs to a lesser extent, but when you're dealing with cameras, um, they pick up every little bit and you have to change the white balance. This is the pinout for the 555 timer, the triple five timer. And this, what I'm going to be using is a 556 because I'm going to be using a two channel setup because I have the lights overhead here and I'm also going to have some uh, light on the side here that I would like. So if I have something here and I want to be able to see the side of it, maybe the display, I can set this over here and adjust the brightness of it independently of the of the lights over top. And this is a very crude setup, very cheap, but you know, it works. Why not build it yourself? So this is the chip I'm going to use. And essentially a 556 is just a dual 555. You have one 555 down here, another one right here, and then they share the positive and ground. Now in this schematic, they're using a transistor. It happens to be a MOSFET. You don't need to use a MOSFET. You can use uh, any, you know, any switching transistor that can handle the amount of current that you that you want to use. You can run the LEDs straight off of the triple five. The problem with doing that is these can't handle a high amount of current, and they're not designed for it. And that's why you would run it to the base of the MPN transistor, which would then allow this to act as a switch to allow current through um, whatever device you're trying to run. You can even use this for a uh, motor as well. So first thing I'm going to do is test the circuit out. I'm going to use a breadboard, and this one is, as you can tell, pretty old, but it still works. Uh, this is back in the Radio Shack days, and I've had this for many years. I have a few of them. And for those that don't know, these are all connected together. So if you put a chip here, you can put a wire in any of these holes here, and it'll be connected to that pin. Generally, the outsides are all connected together, but on this one, um, these five are connected, these five are connected, but they're not connected together, so you have to run little jumper leads to connect them all, which is no big deal. Now what I'm going to do before we get too far, since these pin numbers are going to be different because we're using a different chip, I'm just going to go through and update them on here. So uh, pin 3 is the out, and on here the output, where is it, is 5. So we'll make that 5. Tail, terrible handwriting. And pin 4 is the reset, and it's also 4. So I have the two rectifier diodes here. They're recommending um, on this schematic, they want 1N4148s. I don't even know what these are. These are, I think, probably 4001s. 1N4001s. Shouldn't matter too much. There we 
All right, and I got a couple caps. This is 104, which is 0 0.01 microfarad. So we're going to take three. You know, let's move this IC down a little bit. Let's move this down a bit. So we have easier access to uh, ground. All right, so 104, which is 0 0.01. It's going to be three. So we'll just drop three straight to ground. And then we're going to go to six straight to ground. Or two. Since six and two are bridge, we're just going to take it right off two for the other cap, which is a point one microfarad. It's a one of three. And then let's bridge six and two. So we got two, three, four, five, six. Perfect. All right, to spare you the agony of watching me do this, I went ahead and built it. And you'll notice there's two other transistors on here. This one here is just a linear power regulator. It's an eight volt regulator. And since I'm going to be running 12 volts in here, the chip can have can technically handle it, but it's going to be pushing these resistors kind of hard uh, in the setup that they have. So rather than worrying about that or putting larger resistors on it, um, I'm just going to run less voltage to the timer. Nothing wrong with that. And since it's a very low current, this is not going to be generating much heat. This here is a TIP41, which is an NPN switching transistor. And essentially, we're going to be running 12 volts to this. Um, the output is going to be going to the base, and this is going to be opening and closing to allow current to flow through, which will be 12 volts. So, because I have the camera on auto, I'm not sure how well this is going to show up, but let's give it a shot. So I have the power supply set to 12 volts, and let's plug it in. And there we go, it lights up. So now if I turn the potentiometer... It should dim. And it gets brighter. So let's try this. Let's turn these down. Turn them on a little bit. So, okay. I'm not sure how well this is going to come across over the camera. But you see that? Notice how the color or the uh, yeah the color temperature of the LEDs never really changes until it's really dim. Then you get a little bit of a change, but and actually in person I don't see that. But on camera, a little bit. They get a little they get brighter, but they don't change colors like a lamp would if you had just a regular light bulb and you used a dimmer on it. You would notice it would turn orange as as you dimmed it. Same thing with these lights. I have a dimmer on this. And this is the one that it came with, but it's just a cord. I'll show you. It's just a cord here. And it works pretty well, but I don't want something hanging. I actually want to actually have a box set here with a couple dials that I can turn. Now, to build this, I'm going to be using proto boards. And these are just prototype boards. And you can get them in, in various sizes. And where's the box that it's going to be going into? So this is going to be going into this. Now there's little channels in here where the board can actually sit so it's not laying you know on the bottom of the of the of the box. The problem is none of the boards I have currently fit that. So I'm gonna have to make something work. So what I'm thinking is Although it's not going to be pretty, I don't care about how it's going to look inside. I care about how it works. Solder two of those together, and that way I can slide it in and out. And if we line up the holes just right, we can actually use the entire thing. Yeah, forget everything I just said. Um, that was a stupid idea. So what I did instead was I modeled up a bracket, printed one off, and this will allow you to... Allow me to drop the board on here. And 
There we go. And then you can slide in on little rails like that. So go ahead and build the board. And here it is, final product. Well, the board anyway. I have the case in the bracket here. I'll put that on shortly. So we have the 8 volt regulator, linear regulator right here. And I soldered it to the board just for a little bit more surface area. Um, it only gets warm to the touch because this IC is not pulling much, much current. So it should be fine. These two here are NPN switching transistors, which are uh, tipped 40 ones. And they're right now doing about a fraction of what they're meant to do as far as uh, wattage. So... I'm not too worried about those heating up, and in the tests that I've done, they, they haven't even gotten warm to the touch, so don't need any heat sinks. We have a, a connector here for, where did I put it? There you go, here's the power connector, or I'm sorry, the power switch, which connects to that. And then we have the two pots right here, which I may throw some uh, hot glue on because these wires like to break loose because they're so thin. And because I could not find the nuts to fasten them to the plate, and it was getting late, and I didn't feel like tearing the whole place apart, even though I set them right next to me, I just printed some. And these actually thread on perfect. So, once I get the board in the box, uh, which is right here, um, thread those on, and hopefully they're in the right direction and they're not backwards. If they are, I can only switch the wires. It's not a big deal. But before we do any of that, let's plug this all in, and I'll show you how it works. So I have the power supply set to 12 volts, and we're just going to connect that to the ground tab. Now these are not ground here, so we've got to be careful not to do that, but that should be okay right there. And it's turned off. And I was going to use a uh, a light up power switch, but I realized that it had a neon bulb in it, and that's not going to work too well with 12 volts. It's actually not going to work at all. And the outputs that I use, some people may yell, but I for things like this, I use RCA jacks. Now, yeah, I know this is for audio or video, but I have so many of these cords, and I can get them so cheap at local Goodwills, and most of these cables are built well enough that they can handle a decent amount of current. So I'm just going to use those. And here is our light. We'll aim that down so it doesn't blind the camera. Let's turn it on. We'll see which channel this is. You'll see it dims. And all I'm doing is turning the potentiometer. Let's go to the other channel. And you'll notice I am using two different pots because uh, I'm using, you know, recycled parts. So I couldn't find two identical pots currently. So this is a 10K and this is a 100. I'm going to use the 100 for the overheads and the 10K for this light here. And the only difference is going to be is. The 10K isn't going to get as dim as the 100K channel, which is fine because this is pretty dim to begin with. This is only meant as a supplemental lighting. And you know what? Let me do this. Let me uh, throw a little bit of hot glue on there. Okay, so now that it's glued, and you had a computer locked up right as I was applying that, so but that's okay because I think we all know how to, uh, you know, use hot glue. And put this in. And what I did, I used some heat shrink around the end just to take the strain off, and to hopefully hold the wire in place. Just slide that in. Thank you. 
close enough. Like I said, this is going to be sitting under my bench, so I'm not really going to be looking at it. It's going to be more by feel. I just want the damn thing to work. Okay, so does anything look different? It shouldn't. So we're right now running completely off the new controller. This is the old one. So that's mounted underneath the desk. So that one there is the overhead and the camera light. And this is the supplemental light, which I'm holding in my hand. And oh, by the way, there's also a power switch there. Yeah, so everything works. You can see everything dims. Here I can even dim this, and you can see the side light. So I'm happy. I'm very happy. So if you have any questions or comments, leave them down below, and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.